Hey everybody, in this video we are going to talk about SNVs and SNPs. Uh, before we get started, let's review a little bit from the last video. So if you remember, the last video was sort of an overview on the human genome. And we ended with sort of a recent discovery that human genomes are 99.9% .9 identical to one another. So the average human genome is only uh, different at 5 million positions uh, with respect to the human reference genome. So only 5 million positions. So 99% of these differences are what we call single nucleotide variants or SNVs. And that, you know, that this is pretty self explanatory, right? So that means if someone has a G at one position, uh, the other person might have a C or an A or a T. So that's a single nucleotide variant. So 1% of the differences are what we call indels. So insertions or deletions relative to the reference. Uh, copy number variants. So I don't have any specific examples of these, but what these could be is, is uh, small duplications or even gene duplications. I don't have any specific examples of these. I wish I did. And uh, also including in this 1%, one per, 1%, not 0.1%, 1 1%, 1 uh, small inversions. So what this means is, you know, a, a little bit of a, a sequence, instead of going that way, you know, let's say it's going from left to right, it's flipped around the other way. And so we can bet scientists are still characterizing you know, the importance of, of these indels in, in, say, our different phenotypes or, or indels and copy number variants and small inversions. So we're going to talk mostly about these right here because you can do a lot with single nucleotide variants and uh, more important, importantly, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So let me talk a little bit more about these with uh, a diagram. So with SNVs, we can have different alleles. So this is a term we have used in the past to refer to different versions of the same gene, right? So we started the class, essentially started the class talking about Mendel's pea plants and how we had what a uh, uh, D allele for one uh, tall plants and, and a little D allele for dwarf plants. So big D and little d. So different versions of the same gene. So you can also have SNVs that are alleles. So let me explain what I mean. So let's take the reference genome and assume we're looking at a part of the reference genome. And I'm going to put some just random bases in here and it continues on. And so just a random part, random chromosome in the reference genome. I'll put the complementary strand in here. And I can make this the five prime end, three prime, five prime, three prime. And remember with the reference genome, one strand is plus, is designated as the plus strand. Each chromosome, one strand in each chromosome is designated as the plus strand. The other one is the minus strand. And okay, so let's take another, so random, you know, uh, piece of DNA, same location in just say a random person. So everything's identical here. Um, let's say except for, let me see. Well, yeah, this position right here. I think I want to do this one. So instead of a C, there's an A here. Uh, 
And then I can put the complementary strand in here. There's a T here. Okay, so where are they different? Different right here. Okay, so so we have two, so this is a single nucleotide variant, SNV. And we have two different alleles, right? So we can say for this position right here, whatever that position is, let's say it is position 1 million on chromosome 1. So the reference genome has what we would say the C allele for this position. And this individual here has what we would call the A allele for that position. So it's a little weird to consider single bases to be alleles, but yeah, we can do that. With single nucleotide variants, we consider them to be alleles. So the reference genome has a C allele at that position. The This individual here has an A allele at that position. And why aren't we reporting, why, do, why wouldn't we say CG? Well, that'd be kind of confusing, wouldn't it, if we said a CG allele, because, you know, the G could be up there, or the C could be down here, no. So we, so we sim try to simplify things, and we're talking about alleles, we're always referring to the base on the plus strand of the DNA molecule. So that's why we can say C allele up here, A allele right there. Now, single nucleotide variants, okay, we just went over how we can refer to them as alleles. So single nucleotide variants. So any base, any single base that is different from the reference genome. And single nucleotide variants, they can occur in other organisms too, right? You just need to discover them with respect to the reference genome for that organism. So any single base that is different from the base in the reference genome. So single nucleotide variants, if we discover them, they may be unique to one or a few closely related individuals. Right? So so me and you know my parents and like my maybe my daughters, uh, we could all have have one, you know, a single nucleotide variant that we all share because we're all closely related. And maybe no one else in the in the world has that uh, difference with respect to the reference genome. So that would be, you know, and that's a single nucleotide variant. Still counts as a single nucleotide variant. Now, scientists are very interested in these other, you know, category of single nucleotide variants called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So essentially a single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPs, also just simply called SNPs. Now what are these things? So essentially single nucleotide polymorphisms, these are any SNV found at a certain level a certain percentage of a population. And typically we consider this 1%. So if there's a single nucleotide variant and it's found in one or more percent of the population, then that's considered a single nucleotide polymorphism. So, okay, and these are really interesting, interesting for a number of reasons. And uh, in the next video or two, I will hopefully be able to show you why they are, are so useful for studying human genetics. So let's take a certain position here. 
let's say this is an SNP, you know, so all SNPs are SNVs, but not all SNVs are SNPs. I think that works. So let's say this is an SNP right here. So I'm not going to diagram the other bases. This is a piece of DNA. There's an A here, a T here. We'll call this SNP1. And I think if you've read the notes, you'll see that SNPs are given database names, like start with an RS, and then they have like crazy numbers over here. So, but for, for this, let's just, you know, come up with a hypothetical SNP, we'll call it SNP1. And let's say this SNP right here, A, this is the plus strand, this A allele occurs in 28% of the population, human population. We'll consider the whole world here. Now down here, we'll say the other 72% have a different allele, have a G. So, and that's kind of weird, right? Because there are four nucleotides, right? How come we don't have, you know, 28% in A, 13% uh, T, and now 33% C, and then the rest G. Well, why doesn't that happen? So, you know, it's not really clear exactly why that doesn't happen that often, but for the most part, for each SNP, there's usually a major allele, one major allele, and one minor allele. Where the major allele is held by most of the population, or the majority of the population, and the minor allele is, is found in uh, a smaller percentage of the population. So another interesting thing about SNPs is that in the human genome, they occur on average, so on average, every 300 base pairs. So I can put, why don't we put some other SNP positions over here. And we'll assume this is about 300 base paired right here, the distance between these two. And we'll call the, the SNP on the left, we'll call this SNPL, and the SNP on the right will be SNPR. And we can do the same thing down here. Okay, and for this one, I'll give this a G here and C here. And then down here, we'll give an A here and a T here and a T here and a A here. Okay, so, so we have three SNP positions and these chromosomes here have what? A G, A, and a C for those. And then this chromosome down here, or we can consider these individuals here, uh, has an A, G, and a T there. Now, if we were to look, let's say in a, a different person who has an A, say right here for SNP1, you know, what do you think the odds, the probability of the person also having a G here instead of an A? You know, say this person has to have a G or an A. What do we think it would be? The same thing for over here. Let's say for this SNPR, the major uh, allele is, you know, is either a C or a T, because we only have two, we have C or T. So the either one, major allele or minor allele. I won't tell you which is which yet. Um, but what do we think the allele is going to be for this individual for SNPR? knowing that they have an A there. Well, it turns out almost all, you know, most of the time, I don't give a number, 
I'd like to say 100%, but you know, I hate doing that with biology. But we say almost always, almost always, if there's an A here, and we know this person has an A here and a G here, and an A here and a C here, that this other person here with this A is also gonna have a G there and a C here. So by knowing, say the genotype of the individual for SNP1, you can, you can almost predict with high confidence that, that the, the identity of the SNP uh, allele uh, next to this one. And why is that the case? Why is that the case? So now you can probably guess, you know, it has to do with crossing over and linkage, right? So crossing over and linkage. So, so the closer two things are together, the more likely they are to um, be transmitted together through meiosis, right? So crossing over doesn't occur everywhere between every position on a chromosome during meiosis. So these things tend to stick together. Now, maybe we can explain that in a slightly different way. So let's say we have, let's, let's say, okay, these are my chromosomes here. Chromosome one inherited from my mother, maternal parent. Chromosome one from the paternal parent. Now, let's look at a piece of DNA like up here near the top here. And here are those SNPs, you know, maybe I'll, I'll name them the same way, but I might not get the bases correctly um, relative to what we just diagrammed. So for this one up here, I'll put GAC. So this is the plus strand, the minus strand down there. And let's say this is what I inherited from my father. Well, the other reason I wanted to do this right here was because, you know, humans are diploid. And in the previous example, you know, we were not really distinguishing between uh, haploid conditions where people only have one allele or organisms only have one allele for each each uh, gene on each chromosome and a diploid organism. So humans are diploid. So we have to keep track of, of two alleles for each SNP, unless we're talking about the, the X and Y chromosomes in males. So here, Okay, so in here are the SNPs I inherited, let's say, from, from my mother. So we're looking at these segments of these chromosomes, this segment from my father, this segment inherited from my mother. And so this right here, we can derive my SNP profile for these three SNPs. So SNPL, SNP1, in SNPR. So I'm going to put M for the SNPs inherited from my mom and uh, P for the SNPs inherited from my papa. I don't call him that, I call him dad, uh, but paternal parent. So, and I can list them paternal G A C, G A C, and for maternal A G T, A G T. Okay, so you have my SNP profile here for these three SNPs on chromosome one. And I inherited different alleles from my mother than I did from my father. It doesn't have to be that way. I could have inherited the identical ones, but so I'm heterozygous for alleles at each of these positions. Now, the alleles I inherit from my dad or my mom, so they're inherited as a haplotype block. And if you stick with genetics, 
and uh, or become a doctor, you're going to hear a, a lot about SNP haplotypes. Now, haplotypes, this, this word, it, it, it refers to more things than just SNPs. So it's essentially a haplotype is um, a group of DNA variants that tend to be inherited as a single unit. Okay, so see how these SMPs are all located next close to each other on a chromosome? So one would tend to inherit, you know, if you inherit a G here, SNPL, you're also likely to inherit an A at SNP1 and a C at SNPR because they're located close together and they're on the same chromosome. So they are usually transmitted as a single unit. And we can see that down here. So uh, from GAC right here, and for these things too, down here, AGT. So these are haplotypes. This is an SNP haplotype. I happen to inherit this haplotype from dad and this haplotype from my mother. Now, haplotypes tend to, SNP haplotypes tend, oh, these blocks tend to spread through human populations as single units. And you know, why is that? And you know, it's kind of hard to understand, right? How come crossing over doesn't shuffle these up? You know, so we can end up with all different combinations. If we have three, one, two, three SNPs here, three different nucleotides, one would say, oh, okay, we should find eight possible haplotypes in, in our population. But we don't. We don't. We generally only find two. So that's sort of a complicated question, a complicated topic, and scientists are still working out you know, why we tend to, you know, I guess more details on these haplotype blocks. Um, some things I would like to know. So how many crossovers on average per chromosome per meiosis in humans. And this might be something we can figure out already. I don't know if we have. And it would take some research to figure this out. So in uh, so during spermatogenesis and oogenesis, how many crossovers occur on average per chromosome per meiosis in humans? Because if there aren't that many, then one can understand how SNPs tend to be transmitted through our population as single units. So also another question, you know, let's say for every one million, these are advanced questions. I don't expect you to be able to answer this. I would need to do some research on this to figure it out uh, if it's known yet. So for every one million base pair, say for A, let's say for A, one million base pair segment in human genome, So what is the probability that the segment experienced a crossing over event in previous generation? So what is the probability that a 1 million base pair segment of the human genome, you know, of any chromosome, has experienced a crossing over event in the previous generation. And then what about two generations, three generations? And it may be that this is very low. This is very low. And this is why SNP haplotypes that are linked together on a chromosome tend to stick together and spread through populations like that. And that would explain why We can go back here, that if someone is an A here and a G here, if they're also an A here, then we'd be pretty sure that they're also going to be a G here. That would help explain 
this phenomenon right here. And SNP haplotypes and SNP blocks are important for genome-wide association studies, which we will briefly talk about in, I think, either the next video or the video after that. Okay, so we are also going to take a look at, in the next video, um, at a genome sequencing service, or SNP, sorry, not genome sequencing, SNP genotyping service called 23andMe, and how they can use SNP profiles to give you ancestry and health information, and we are going to focus on uh, health information. Okay, see you in the next video.